Welcome to the first of 2024 sessions for the Tipsy Open Learning Series. And today we're going to be looking at application of systems thinking tools, um, particularly looking at the motion theory of change tool, which is in the TIP resource lab. And I'm happy to see that we have some of the creators of the tool potentially joining us today. Uh, this is quite an interesting tool because although um, it was developed with the, the Transformative Innovation Policy Consortium, it's been a you know a collaborative process. It was developed at, on, with a team who were working with Climate Kick on a project. And today we've got a really lovely example of how this tool is being reinterpreted and adapted in a different context. And that's going to be the focus of the conversation today. So I'd like to um, welcome our host for today. Um, but first of all, just say that this is very much a community led space. Um, it's intended to support learning and networking across the community of people working on transformative innovation policy globally. And we've had registrations from all different continents today. So we really encourage people to connect where possible. Feel free to use the chat or, or to talk to one another. We will have some breakout exercises as well today. Um, so I'd like to welcome, um, we have three guest hosts today, um, Eva Valencia, Adriana Alera, and Florencia Rezar, um, who are all part of the Tricolor Coalition in Mexico City. And Eva is also a member of our network of coaches for the TIP Resource Lab, and she's a scaling coordinator for the International Maze and Wheat Improvement Centre. Well, Adriana is also working for the Bezos Earth Fund, so quite diverse um, range of professional expertise. Um, and they're joined by Matias Ramirez, who's from the core team of Tipsy and is also lead in the Tipsy core for the Latin American hub. Now, what I did want to say before we start is just share some of the principles for these open learning events. Um, the idea is very much that this is a collaborative process and it depends on everyone taking part. So please, when you have the opportunity to connect share your screens, you know, turn your cameras on and try to contribute. And um, also that it's a learning process for everyone involved and um, sometimes things don't go to plan. And that we really value your own lived experience of what we're working with, that there's no right or wrong way to do this. And that it's very much about trying to align visions across different approaches in different parts of the world. So the plan for today, as I mentioned, is that we'll focus on the motion transformative theory of change tool in the TIP resource lab. And we'll start with presentations from Matthias and Eva, um, who will be talking about transformative theories of change and how this tool can be interpreted through the lens of a responsible innovation framework. Then we will pause, we'll have about 30 minutes of a group exercise where we'll be doing um, looking at the tool in groups and feeding back on how this might be applied and made relevant in very different contexts. And then we'll close with some discussion. So that's our plan for today. And before I hand over then to Matthias to kick off, I also wanted to say um, a big thanks to Christoph Rodnick at the Austrian Institute of Technology, who's in a different time zone and can't be here today, but has been working on this series. And also to our team at Sussex, Annie Chowdhury and Pip Bolton, who are working on the coordination for the session today. So thanks everyone. And I'll hand over to you, Matthias, to kick off. So as, as Vicky said, my name is Matthias. I'm um, one of the co-directors of Tipsy, together with Sandra, Bonnie, and um, Johan Schott. And a lot of my work, not all of it, but a lot of it is actually in Latin America, where um, in 2020 we formed the Latin America Hub that's been working in um, Colombia, in um, Mexico, in, in Chile, and more recently um, in Peru. We, um, we, we've we got a big project working in, in the Amazon area which is very interesting in terms of applying these ideas so you will understand that we're trying to apply ideas of transformative innovation and specifically ideas of TIP or TIPSI in very very uh, different contexts uh, and contrasting context, context and I want to share some of those experiences with you as well as explain the basics of what is the discussion today which is on the um, on the theory of change so let me just start off by saying something about what is transitions, because some of you may be new to this. And um, <clears throat> the ideas of transitions really emerged from very um, practical 
um, studies of where countries or regions have shifted from a way of organizing these big systems such as water supply or energy or food or transport into other ones. And what's important to, to, to understand, and, and this is one example, uh, you might think of uh, the Netherlands as an ultra modern uh, technological society. In fact, just a hundred years ago, it wasn't that at all. It was, it, it, um, this, this provides an example of changes in the way in which sanitation systems emerged. Um, and what you see here is that the, the shift from having a, a situation in which human waste was something which was basically left on the streets, something which was um, seen as a nuisance, but accepted because people thought that there was no alternative. Over a long period of time, over something like 20 years, you see this emergence of this sanitary system that we understand now, which is one in which human waste is treated uh, differently. And, and the way that emerged is a combination of knowledge, of science and technology. In this case, it was the link was made between human waste and illness, particularly in children and things like cholera, which didn't exist before. Secondly, social changes associated, for instance, in this case, to population increase, um, improvement in, in democratic structures, which meant that the state had um, taxes to be able to actually do something about it and create common, common goods around this, but also social values and social movements. So the movement around um, democratization, the movement around social movements of the poor um, and, and changes in culture were very, very important. And they all came together to actually produce force, if you like, the state to intervene and to, and to move to change the way in which human waste was treated. But it didn't happen straight away. If you look at the bottom three cases, there was a lot of experiments um, before it was actually decided that the system that we know now, which is around individual toilets and pipes and so on, reservoirs, was actually introduced. There was a lot of experimentation between different people about the best way to go before uh, one road was chosen. And this is a typical case of a transition. It's these ideas which have um, um, provided the, 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 uh, the ammunition, the ideas and the theories around which we think about transitions now in terms of energy systems, transport systems, and so on and so forth. So it's it's worth understanding what this is. It's a system change, which involves different elements, social, technological, but also involves a lot of experimentation with different road routes and different roads, different pathways, different alternatives, okay? So when we talk about policy, we're talking about opening up that space so that we can think about changes in systems um, and, and you know it, it, it takes time and it's part of a process of democracy now the specific area that we're going to focus on today is that of the theory of change okay now theories of change are not something which um is exclusive to transformative innovation policy theories of change have been around for a long time and they are used uh, very commonly both by non-governmental organizations by consultancies, by governments, and so on, because it's just it's just a way of, of of looking at what you're doing as you're moving. And there are, in my experience, advantages to theories of change and disadvantages to theories of change. Okay, and it's very important that we understand both of these and how to do them. But also that when we think about theory of change in transformative innovation, we we put on top of that theory of change a theory of transitions okay we work with a theory of transitions and in that theory of transitions is called the multi-level perspective and then we use that theory to guide the way in which we actually implement this in practice okay so let me just show you here this is one way in which we we think about this this is always a simplified representation of the way in which reality happens but it's a good way to start so often when we think about theories of change, we start thinking about what area do we want to intervene, which in this case, we're gonna call the experiment. Or what system are we thinking of? Are we thinking of a transport system? Are we thinking of a food system? 
are we thinking of something which is regional which is which is specific to one particular city or 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 area or rural area so let's let's think about the area that we're in and let's try to make sure that it's something that we can do and that we understand what system or systems that is part of it then in the second stage what we need to try to do is because transformative innovation works at the level of systems change okay we need to try to define what system we are thinking about okay and that's not always easy okay but what we, we this is what we talk about the socio technical regime so if you're thinking about a change in transport that regime is 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 to do with mobility system because it provides a service the service of mobility if you're thinking about water if you're thinking about food if you're thinking about energy what are the characteristics of that system that we're working in i'm going to show you an example in a minute and also if we want to work on transitions when we think about that socio-technical regime why do we want to change it what is it about that regime that is so bad what is it is it a is it a problem of unsustainability is it a problem of exclusion is it because that regime is not working well what 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 aspects of it is it and also what characterizes it is it very centralized is it decentralized um who runs it who are the main actors and so on so we want to we want to think about the broader picture the bigger picture about the system that we're working in and then we think about a generic theory of change is a generic theory of change is essentially what are the alternatives the general alternatives that we can think about within that regime so if you think about for instance the energy system the main the main alternatives which are developing perhaps are around renewables so they could be solar panels they could be wind they could be uh, uh, hydrogen that they, they could be developing all sorts of alternatives which we that we may be part of we may not be part of but we need to understand what's that generic sort of change that's emerging and then we pass over and as i say i'm going to give you examples of this to a specific theory of change which is what we are going to do about this what our project and how our project fits into the generic theory of change and that's the first thing that's crucial here the specific theory of change that we have which is based on on our project or whatever has to be part of that generic idea it contributes to that generic theory of change okay and that's 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 very important because that's how we're contributing to systems change the final part is those transformative outcomes i'm not going to talk about that here it's got to do perhaps a little bit more with evaluation but it's it's an important aspect of it that we just don't have time so i'm just going to focus more on the generic and specific theory of change okay so um what do these theories of change then actually do so when you when you come and think about your your uh, theory of change you need to think about the relationship between the experiment that you're doing the system that you're working in and how and the assumptions that you're making about how that may change okay now within TIPC within TIPSI we tend to when we think about theories of change we tend to think about this idea of MLP which is the multi-level perspective now what does that mean that means that we we define a system a socio-technical system in terms of technologies um, cultures users etc etc and our mechanism for change is what we call niches transformative niches and then we try to 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 think about niches as a protected space in which alternatives could develop and that's the basis essentially of our theory of change our theory of change is is how to develop niches which can um, change influence develop alternatives to a particular unsustainable um, uh, socio-technical regime okay and that's very very important in terms of our work so here's a, here's the example that i want to that i want to share with you this is an example from a um a, a workshop that we did in mexico a few years back 
and it's it's called um it's it's about changing food it's called plato de buen comer masateco okay so it's essentially about a a project or a program in which a group of people so so if you go back to my my first step uh, uh, a couple of minutes ago i was talking about the experiment yeah so this is the experiment that this group of people wanted to develop and the experiment is based on three general aims it's about it's it's in a it's in an area of, of mexico and it's about greater proportion of food to be consumed from the same region so try to avoid um too much um it, it, it's a way of generating and encouraging local industry, local agriculture, and people working in this agriculture to have a demand and to get a decent price for what they work. And also to have a good range of healthy food. And to do that, they want to encourage people to consume food from the same reason, a region. It's also about encouraging varieties of local, produ local food to be produced. Because you've got this situation more often Big multinationals will sometimes come in and they encourage agricultural producers just to produce a very narrow range of mono produce. So it's try to try to encourage a variety of, of, of products and to ferment more. To, and, and to do that, you have to create demand. And to do that is to ferment participation of people and families in cooking and experimenting with food. So once you've defined that experiment, then we try to relate it to that system. So in this case, the system is the food regime. And here what we've done in, in very simple terms, simple terms in this case is, is quite useful, is that we've said, well, what characterizes them? What characterizes the regime? Well, it's based on food, based on aesthetics, cheap food, industrialized methods, long value chains. And that has negative impacts on climate change, on deforestation and on the quality of the food, okay? So then the specific theory of change, okay, was to um, to try to 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 develop, sorry, let me just go back, the, to, to, tr to try to, to strengthen local innovation systems, to connect local initiatives with the experiments that are taking place, to systemize new practices for local cooking, and to develop a knowledge base based in local universities, colleges, and international links. So it's very, very concrete, okay? It says what you're gonna do and, 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 and how you're gonna do it. And then the experiments are the specific things that you're going to do. So new methods of cooking, biodiverse food production, linked to local lands and so on. So it's, it's very, very specific, the plan about what you're going to do. You've got a generic sort of uh, critique of the system You've got a way in which you think that can be changed. And then you've got a, a specific way of actually implementing that. And often this is where sometimes people get stuck because they their aims are very general. So you have to bring them down and be specific about what you're going to do. So the actual, the actual process by which this happens, and this is the specific theory of change, is you've got your context, which is your regime. You've got your input which is the project or program that you're working on. So this is the, it could be the money that you have, the time that you have, the people that you have, the contacts that you have. And this is very important because you've got to do something realistic in the time that you have, okay? And then you define what activity you're actually gonna do to implement that specific theory of change, okay? Which leads to a set of outputs and outcomes. Now, let me explain this because it's very, very important. So your, your outputs are the specific things that your activities are going to produce, okay? So your outputs could be, for example, I don't know, establishing a book on new recipes for the local area. It could be um, setting up a network of families who are going to work on, on, on cook, new, new forms of cooking, okay? So it's, it's very, very specific things associated to your activities. And then your outcomes are the, are the changes in practices that you want to achieve as a consequence of those outputs, okay? So the outcomes would be um, a greater amount of food 
which is consumed, which is demanded or greater variety locally produced food, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, it could be more cooking from natural products. It could be um, a richer diet. Okay, now those things uh, are very important when it comes to evaluation. Because if your evaluation is only based on your outputs and not on your outcomes, then, then often you won't achieve those outcomes. And people, people feel they're being evaluated, they're being controlled. And it's very, very important that you establish that relationship between your process, your product, and your outcome. I've got it in yellow because that's where most of the thinking and the learning actually takes place. Most of That's where it should take place. Okay. Now, you make assumptions here that an activity is going to lead to a specific output and a specific outcome. And that's where you've got to be open to flexibility, to changing some of those relationships, and to really focus on that particular part of the exercise. Okay, so this is the this is how we translated that in, in the case of the example that we had. Okay, we had the context, which would be the characteristics of the system. The inputs, which was the, the resources, the support from organizations, your social media support, whatever it is that you can actually do in practice, okay, because you can't you can't change the system overnight. You've got to you've got to work around specific things, and usually you have to think at a smaller scale. Then you think of your activity. So in this case, the Plato Masoteco was workshops in which you bring together people from universities, schools, and national experiences. And then you do extension activities with families, not just women, women included, but also with children and with men. And you learn how to sew and you know how to cook in a more healthy way. What is the idea? So it's workshops, okay, and extension activities. That's the activity. What's the idea that you're going to produce from that? Cooking guides, a new extensive network based on alternative practices. Okay, that's the output that you want. And what you do is that you hope but that will lead to or contribute to local regulations, replicate and reproduce cooking practices through uh, schools and purchasing of practices of cuisines based on local products. OK, so those are the outcomes that we hope, hoped it would achieve. And through that, at the end, you might have your impact, which are healthier food production, more diverse improvement in the health of people. It's very difficult to measure impacts. Those things tend to happen in the longer scale, okay? But what you what you really want to do is that you have some sort of correlation between these, these processes, these outputs and outcomes. Let me tell you that often the assumptions made in these three areas are often wrong. They're often simplistic. But that's okay because you can change them, and that's how you learn about how, these, how change takes place and how these actual things happen. So going back to this issue of assumptions, it's important when you um, uh, to be constantly reviewing the assumptions when making our theory of change. OK, questions to ask. Why do why do we have this theory of change? What changes do we want to achieve? What do we think the actors or groups or entities need to change? So it's often the assumptions that we make are wrong. Uh, because we we misunderstand what actors, often grassroots actors, really need or how they relate to things. We make assumptions about how they work, about how people react to things. But often these are, these are wrong. And so what we have to do is that we have to talk to people, involve people in those processes and be prepared to change. OK, um, so so that sort of participation and the exercise that we're going to do a little bit later is is precisely sort of that reflexivity is crucial other things that are very important to consider we have found in the work that we've done uh, certainly in latin america that often projects are proposed in very sort of generic terms okay we are going to change these and and they over promise you know to get the money so we're going to offer an enormous amount of change and very um, optimistic scenarios and often that's just it, it's 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 not tied down it's too ambitious and it's not tied down about what's actually going to happen so that process between the generic and the specific theory of change 
needs to be very, very clear. Be specific, but also make it feasible in terms of what's going to happen. Don't spend three quarters of your project and your uh, planning what you're going to do, okay? Because then all your energy will go into these vast plans that often won't be able to be carried out because they're too complex. So keep it simple and focus on the learning that can occur through that process, okay? Think about some statements, like in the Masadeco case, you know, improving the quality of the food and so on and so on, and um, specify the people and the institutions that you actually want to change. Some other things to consider, this is very quickly because I've gone over my time slightly, just uh, it, start not with a fixed idea of what the world is like, but try to do some brainstorming, okay? Propose some activities and strategies that may influence change. Try to have a deeper discussion initially, bring in different actors, discuss ideas, open ideas, and create strategies of change. Don't make a final decision about what you're gonna do at the beginning because you may be wrong, okay? And the evaluation process should be one in which you open the process out, okay? And then explore different options, okay? Uh, what, what already exists, who can we influence? Who can we talk to? Who can we influence? Are there actors that have an agency to allow change to actually happen? And then this is just some examples of what we did. This is so. So in this case, you'll see we used a Miro board. OK, and then we it, it's in Spanish because obviously this was in, in Mexico. So, you know, we looked at the we looked at the experiment. We looked at the niches. We looked at the regimes. We developed theories of change, all very movable, all very flexible to be able to work with different things and try out sort of experiment different alternatives. Yeah. And then we try to map that onto this sort of slightly linear process. So it, it's messy here. You've got structures, you've got processes, you've got outputs initially, impacts and so on. Things didn't work. You've got um, in the post-its, you've got activities, you've got actors, we, you can use different colors. So it's messy at first and that's okay. Okay, because you're experimenting, all right? But then when you come to, to do it, and this is the Swedish case, it's all nice and clear, it's all nice and, uh, it, it appears, this is, this is what Vinova did, okay? This is their Swedish National Policy Agency. They wanted to work on transformation of food systems, okay? And they sort of extended this very clear map around um, sort of actors, activities, um, and what they were going to do in each of the cases. It's it's very well developed because there are leading agencies. But let me assure you, when it came to actually putting this into practice, it was far more complex in, in practice. And my final slide was, because I know that uh, one of the things that we wanted to talk about was how do you adjust this to, to the real life cases? Well, my experience is not so much that the theory, that the actual framework changes, but it's how you apply it. And here, particularly if you're working in the global south, you have to think of things like this. When you're talking about transitions from one niche to a regime, sometimes you may find that that regime is not so clear. It doesn't exist in the way that it might do in the north. It's not a formalized regime. It varies according to where you live and where you are. Sometimes it's splintered. Sometimes it's broken up. Sometimes there may be more than one way. Of okay, I'm just about to finish. Yes. Um, do you have the assumptions? Um, should you be constructing niches or should you be bringing knowledge in from niches that already exist? Usually the latter is the better way to doing to doing things. OK, so that's it. That's my. Oh, yeah. Final one. Sorry. Just a bit of a plug. This is if you speak Spanish, this is a book that we brought out. Um, on the experiences of the Latin America hub and it's all free and you can download it at the bottom there um, for yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. That's very helpful. I'll hand over to Eva now. Uh, thank you, Victoria. And uh, hello to everyone. We're very happy to be here to be discussing about this topic. So now I'm going to share my screen. So as Victoria was saying, uh, why are we here? Because we have seen that there are a lot of different system thinking tools that we are creating out there, first in the theory and then in the practice, 
but we have different needs. We live in different contexts, global north, global south. Uh, we are different people. So the aim uh, of this session was precisely to dialogue about how can we adapt these system thinking tools so that they really serve the problems that we are addressing. Uh, my name is Eva Valencia, and together with Adriana and Florencia, that we're in a tricolor coalition, uh, we're going to start exploring a proposal about how to adapt these system thinking tools, but we're really looking forward to also knowing your opinion about this. So why are we all doing this? Well, as we all know, the sustainable development goals <laughs> are complex. It's not uh, realizing 17 objectives separately, but it's really about understanding the interconnections between them. And this shows the, the complexity of the problem that we have today. It's not only about uh, food security, but it's also about the climate change challenges that uh, are occurring in order to change these systems and what we have to do in order to, to make solutions that address this complexity. Well, for this, uh, we have good news. Uh, we have already different system thinking tools that are putting all this theory into com of complexity into practice in order to make it easy, accessible for different types of stakeholders to address these challenges. For example, the systems practice of Amadir Group, the transformative innovation innovation policy resource lab from the University of Sussex. And so also in CIMIT, uh, we have developed the scaling scan uh, that addresses the analysis of the potential of innovations. These are just some examples of some system thinking tools, uh, toolkits and tools that are already out there. However, <laughs> we are living in different geographies. It is very different uh, to be living in a humid place than a dry place in an urban area in Delhi, in Jakarta, in Venice, and we're different people. So we do have different needs that this complexity has to address. And as Matthias was saying, um, we need a way in order to narrow it down and also uh, a concrete way to address this, these challenges with solutions. So as we have different needs, we require different nails. Even when these tools are made, uh, to be applied in different contexts, we have to adapt these tools in order for them to address our needs. So that's why today we wanted to, on the one side, learn more about the transformative theory of change tool uh, that we believe it's very important as it addresses the planning stage <laughs> of the projects in order to address complexity, but also with you to uh, analyze how can we adapt these, these tool and other tools so that they ad address our problems. Basing ourselves as an initial proposal for this on the responsible innovation framework. So as Matthias was saying, uh, what is one of the main changes that this transformative theory of change tool proposes? Instead of thinking linearly of how can we reach a solution by thinking of the deliverables of the outputs, it's about thinking of the outcomes about the results of those deliverables, of those uh, outputs that are really transformative. And now we want to analyze how these tool um, can be adapted. So our proposal in order to adapt it through time and space is to use a responsible innovation framework. What does this uh, framework has? It has four main principles that we have to be anticipatory, be reflexive, be inclusive, and be responsive. So in order to, to use this framework for this tool, the idea is what do we have to think before using this tool? And what do we foresee this tool to be in order to uh, address our needs? To be reflexive, it would be what does this tool have and what does it don't have that can address our needs? Thinking of language, for example, or thinking of other questions that are relevant for us. Thinking on, of, of inclusion, who do we have to invite? With whom do we have to make this tool? And thinking of uh, the responsive, the responsiveness part of this framework, which other adjustments do we have to do in this tool so that they uh, acknowledge the, the different context that we're working on? So this is our initial proposal. <laughs> Uh, to adapt this tool. 
but uh, we would like to ask if you have initially now we will just do a quick cascade uh, exercise in order to to break the ice if you can share in the chat in in like around 20 seconds if you think of other frameworks uh, or questions that you that should be applied to system thinking tools okay so then we'll dialogue over this better <laughs> uh, what is the question again action research exactly the question is if you have other ideas of how to apply systems uh, frameworks in different types of spaces can we define the system action research yes thank you paulina vipashi perfect so these are mm -hmm, exactly locally grounded mm -hmm. <laughs> okay perfect so now we're going to go uh, to the Miro board. So this is uh, what you will all have in the Miro. And the questions here are mainly two. No? So each, each of these is, is for a team, for a breakout group that we will do. On the first part, the idea is to use this as guiding questions of each of the, of each of the, of the topics of the responsible innovation framework um, to guide the conversation in order to assess how to apply this tool. But the idea is that you uh, you don't reply the question of what you would do it in the case, but really to analyze what would you use this tool for, for the transformative theory of change, you no? Know? And to grade in here uh, the ways that you think that you would apply this transformative uh, theory of change how would you adapt this transformative theory of change through different times and spaces? And in here you have different guiding questions uh, based on the responsible framework. And then in the second part, the idea is that you put all these frameworks that you have been putting in the chat and other ideas of how to apply um, these systems thinking tools for your own contexts. So uh, in the, during these 30 minutes, we're going to first uh, go to th through part one, and there should be one leader that uh, guides the discussion so that they can, in the end, present the results. And then in part two, we will use the last 15 minutes in order to do so. We'll come back to the plenary and uh, give some conclusions, exchange of information, and and then and then we will give the final conclusions of all of all of us. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you very much for everyone to have shared other uh, ideas on, on how can we apply the systems thinking tools and in particular the transformative theory of change tool through time and space. And um, now we just have five minutes. So I think uh, we will just have, have a minute, <laughs> a minute just to present quickly uh, the, the discussions. If someone would like to present and then we'll do the, the final wrap up of the session. We were group one, weren't we? So shall I go first? Yes, please. Thanks. Yeah. So um, in terms of what we would use the tool for, um, we talked about using it for NGOs and policy groups for creating change strategies on the ground. Um, in terms of reflexivity and the caveats that we might want to consider when using the tool, we spoke quite a lot about how um, it would need quite a lot of theory of um, the theory behind how change happens. So it's not really very accessible at the moment to lay people without giving some training on top of it. And there might be a little bit too much jargon um, for um, someone not experienced with it to understand. Um, I think that was the same for inclusion really as well. We talked quite a lot about that. Okay. I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, David, and thank you. Uh to group one as well for, for the discussions. Now uh, it's group two. Um, so that's my turn. <laughs> uh, so what we spoke about was uh, regarding time and space, we have to think whether we want to make an analysis of a transformative uh, project that happened in the past over, or we were going to go really into the future in order to put the impact far into the future and then come backwards, or if we want to just analyze something that is happening in the present and we want to make the changes just now. 
So in order to, we have to scope it, the transformative theory of change to really know that the time boundaries and how much information are we going to really uh, take in order to make our plan. Then regarding reflexivity, uh, we spoke about that it, it's important that we analyze who is it better, who is, would be better to use this tool and whether uh, we can make some changes if it's more in a natural or social science aspect of it. Then in the part of inclusion, um, Ranel is saying that it should be, that this tool should be complement, in the part of inclusion and reflexivity, that this tool should be complemented with time series analysis in order to, uh, to not only do the planning of the project, but also to know what could be done when. <laughs> and in the part of responsiveness, um, we said that uh, in, in this tool, we could, if, if we have to scope it a bit further into what is the challenge that you're analyzing. So as to maybe take out some dimensions or put some dimensions in more depth. And finally, we said also in the part of responsiveness that this tool is mainly now analyzing the positive effects, but it's not analyzing the negative effects of it. So maybe that would be also useful in order to, to know the trade-offs of it. And finally, in general, to apply system thinking tools that we should see in which way we can consider also the human elements of, of, of our work and then how in each of your projects uh, can we apply it when we use system thinking tools? Okay, and now, so that was our group. Now group three, <laughs> please. So our group actually had a variety of, um, I would say areas discussed where we'd use the system change um, sort of system over here, right? Uh, and some of those were like taking research to a scale where we have from going from small scale to uh, taking it to a larger sort of implementation scale, controlling for greater range of variables in the research itself or other factors also will give us like an overall picture of what all are we working with. And as long as getting the minute level details of a case study also will help us. And we went from different different fields, say um, from agro agroecological to education as well as to science technology policy. For reflexivity, we had a bunch of points that um, we should be mindful of when we're using this uh, tool, uh, which was most of the assumptions that will be going ahead with the, that we know the knowledge of how the system change is going to work, knowing what we're working on is going to have the impact that we are expecting, but it could be wrong. The experts could give us a little, a little bit more detailed information. It could be completely different than what we had planned out. The stakeholders in the project could have different views on the change itself or different inputs. And we discussed uh, about having them being part of the uh, model theory of change from the very get go so that we are all aligned on the with the model is executed. Uh, in terms of uh, inclusion, uh, we had an interesting conversation of whether everybody should be or if, if a limited group of people should be included where both the sides have pros and cons where on one side, if you have everybody, uh, especially decision making stakeholders, then that kind of uh, theory of change has a more smoother implementation. Uh, whereas when you have a very limited um, uh, set of people, there might be lesser sort of opposition or uh, viewpoints coming into the table. So all of these have their pluses and minuses there. Uh, and when it came to adaptation or responsiveness to the tool itself, uh, what we thought of was whenever the link from the output to outcomes was not meeting, right? When we put down the theory of change and we have some certain assumptions that from the output, the outcome will be seen. If that doesn't work out, then that is when maybe we can check this is uh, how whether the why the theory of change model did not work, and otherwise, if it's working, if it's giving out the goals that we initially planned out, then going ahead with what it is is probably useful. From the team, anything if I've missed out, if you want to add, please do. A great summary from from where I'm standing. <laughs> Thank you. There's um. Eva, and um, did you want to provide any final reflections or, or summary before we close? Uh, yes, well, thank you very much for everyone to exchange your ideas uh, and reflections upon this. I think it's uh, something that we're all interested in. How can we use this system thinking tool so that they really serve 
different sustainability transition processes in all around the world. So I think uh, this will be very useful uh, for us, you know, for us to take away and to consider in which ways uh, do we not only create these tools, but we can also apply them to our own contexts. And so they serve the purpose that we want. Thank you very much, Victoria, all the Tipsy team. And thank you very much, Adriana, Florencia as well uh, from, from my team uh, for this discussion. And uh, really looking forward for the next webinar series. Um, I don't know if um, Adriana, Florencia would like to add something. And if not, Victoria, please. <laughs> Adriana. Thank you so much, everyone. Apologies for my uh, audio that was breaking, uh, but thank you. It was very insightful hearing from you and uh, your different uh, positionality when you use this tool and how it can be adapted in some way that it can be more effectively applied. So thank you for that. Thank you very much. And I can see from the chat that Wendy's offered um, to talk about foresight frameworks and how they might inform this, if there's any any takers for that. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. And I wanted to say a really big thank you to the three of you for joining the session today, along with Matthias. Um, it's been really interesting to see how the journey of this thinking, you know, has come about. Uh, may, I, may I ask that you send this presentation of today? Yes, absolutely. We can share a presentation. And also, I think that given we've generated some really interesting reflections, we'll look at how we can capture that in a blog or something to put into the resource lab alongside the tool and, and to further the journey of this thinking. And I also want to say a special thanks to Paulina for joining today, who was involved in the creation of the tool um, originally as part of the Motion Project a few years ago. So hopefully you'll be able to connect as well outside of, outside of the room. So thanks, everyone. Um, we haven't got our next open series booked in yet but Christoph Brodnick is working on this um, at the moment so very soon we'll have that live on the website and then we'll be sharing details by email as well so hope you can join us again and um, that we can facilitate more conversations between different parts of the world so thanks for your time today and we hope to see you next time <laughs>